Okay, okay, I'm doing it. I'll do the thing where I have a conversation with myself about the game. It's been an eternity, I know, I know, and I have a duty and responsibility as a magician to bring you all some cheap and entertaining wizard content. So here it goes. The Cleric Candlestick is universally regarded as a bad weapon, perhaps even one of the worst weapons in the game. On the surface, it appears to be a straight sword of the same length as the long sword, with very poor damage returns on its primary scaling stat of intelligence, and also the ability to cast sorceries with its R2 instead of the prized straight sword poke. This in and of itself is not underwhelming, but when you consider that it has not only some of the worst AR in the game combined with a relatively poor spell buff compared to other weapon catalyst hybrids, you start to get the impression that maybe this thing is not so good. Well, fellow invader, allow me to tell you that you would be completely correct in that presumption. The candlestick is objectively, numerically, statistically bad in just about every way. However, the candlestick also has a number of virtues which I do not see lauded at all, which allows for an incredibly unique and engaging playstyle, unlike almost any other weapon in the game. This video will be a hybrid lecture and analysis of invasions, as I can speak on them, interspersed with the knowledge I've accrued in using this build. So let us begin with the invasions. I had several builds that I used for this particular setup, one at 60 plus 6, one at 80 plus 10, and one at meta, which was about 133 on the build I used it on. One of the recurring things you will see with just about any sorcerer, this is not unique to the candlestick, is that you can be just so very annoying to hosts that would like to sit by the bonfire with their phantom. You can be incredibly annoying in a number of other situations as well, most specifically the ones that require you to force interactions. Here I've managed to draw him out well, well past the bonfire, as a matter of fact which is honestly not something you see so often. I have a rival sorcerer here with his Moonlight Greatsword, and I'm looking to take him out before I bother to chase down the host with my rapier. This was one of my earlier invasions, so I was getting a lot of misses, and I was still getting a feel for the rapier straight sword combo. And it wasn't until a long ways into using this build that I started to actually get a feel for how the flow of it would work. It's my opinion that this particular setup, having a poking sword in the left hand and a straight sword with the candlestick on your right is probably the best way to go about this, at least in an all-around sort of holistic way, because thrusting sword plus straight sword is one of the strongest weapon combinations just in general, and that just kind of is a testament to the strength of the off-stock and other similar things. Offstock goes with just about everything. Hammers, great swords, axes. It makes weapons that are inherently bad better. So you can see where I got the idea from. Though in truth, the idea came from I am Amish, who uses uh, thrusting sword, straight sword, on many of his builds that I see at many soul levels, most specifically when he's fighting in the woods as like a, an anti-twink, or like a non-twink invader, I should say. When he commented on one of my videos, uh, I think the first candle, like just the short archives invasion I did with the candlestick using the mail breaker, I was like, hmm, how would Amish use this build? And then I, I realized that like, well, it would probably just be with an off stock or something. And then I, I was just thinking about it, and I was like, that would actually be really, really strong if you were able to do that. Because you have so many options. Specifically with the rapier, you have access to a straight sword R1, a rapier L1, casting a sorcery and a parry from any neutral position. That's a lot of very good options to have. Now, a rapier parry isn't like the best thing in the world, but it's certainly nothing to scoff at. And if you have an offhand mail breaker or crystal dagger or something of the like, then I mean, you do get a lot of mileage off of any one parry. 
I actually never really go for them because I forget that I have access to that option because parrying is really just not a thing that is in my arsenal. Um, it, it doesn't really benefit invaders as much as one would like. Uh, but it is there, and it is something you can choose to do. For the higher level builds, like the Soul Level 80 and the 133, I much prefer the S-Stock because you get the L1 Waggle, and I much prefer having the Waggle on to bait the roll to get the L2 so that you can get L2, R1, and then cast, which is the combo that you will see me go for basically every time. L2 poke with the S-Stock to get the hit confirm into the R1, to get the light hit stun into the instant cast from the R1 on the candlestick allows you to do a mix-up into a mix-up into a mix-up, just repeatedly roll catching with any number of spells that you wish. You can play incredibly aggressively with it, but you can also opt to just kind of sit back and be very annoying with soul arrows. Now, I don't think it's advisable to stand back and only shoot soul arrows, because if you wanted to do that, then you could go use a court sorcerer's staff or something, and you would get a lot more damage out of those hits. The real benefit to the Cleric's Candlestick is that you have straight sword R1s, the best R1s in the game, probably, combined with the ability to cancel the best animation in the game, with one of the best hitboxes in the game, into a sorcery. Lag free. Now normally when you have a weapon in one hand and a catalyst in the other hand, you have to wait a very, like, almost half a second or like a whole second between when you swing and when you cast. This is not the case with the candlestick. With the candlestick, you have the option to vortex someone repeatedly. The only time that you're going to have to go through any substantial waiting period is after you cast your sorcery. And if you just want to do R1, R1 into a sorcery, you could do that as well. But I think it's very important to trigger the weak hit stun to force the roll. However, people can just swing out of it, so that is something to keep in mind as well. If they have a strong enough poise weapon, they could swing out of it, but you also have the option to continue swinging. It's a straight sword after all, and having a straight sword on any build automatically makes it better. Now, of course, it wouldn't be it wouldn't be the candlestick without a caveat or some horrible drawback, and that is that it is stamina starved. Your combos require a lot of stamina. And the candlestick's stamina cost for sorceries is not particularly great. It's sort of middle of the road, but it's not on the end of the lighter catalysts. And that is very much to its detriment. Every spell you cast is going to cost a lot of stamina. And every swing you do is going to cost you additional stamina. So there is the opportunity that as you are just wailing on someone, you are just mixing them up over and over again, and you're roll catching them. You might just find that you've run to the end of your green bar, which is all well and good, and it's why I would recommend having the Clarenthy Ring on. Due to the way I allocated certain stats within the build, I had relatively low stamina, which could probably have been solved in the future by taking some points out of FP at meta and turning them into stamina points. Now fortunately at meta, you have the option to have more stamina than at 60 plus 6. There's really nothing particularly stat intensive about this, you only need 10 strength and 12 dex for the S-Stock, and that's just about it. Um, everything else is just a matter of having 12 faith for the candlestick, and you're good to go. You can have 60 int, you can have all of the health you want, you can have 40 attunement, which I strongly recommend. Actually, you might not even need 40 attunement with the candlestick. Mostly endurance. You mostly need endurance. I always opt for 40 attunement because I want to be casting, casting, casting. I do not want there to be any downtime when I cannot be throwing spells because that utterly defeats the purpose of running a sorcerer. If you're just going to cast a couple of soul arrows, maybe a crystal soul spear, then look, what's the point? 
you can see that these lovely friends here have caught on to my game, that I, I will not fight all three of them at once, and that I'm really just trying to kite them with soul arrows. I'm actually a little bit surprised that I beat out that uh, swing with my L2. Now this is more of a personal failing than a failing of the build, but I never really learned how to deal with poise properly. I know the answer is to reaction roll the slower swings and try to get a backstab, but honestly, when it comes down to it, I would much rather just time the soul arrow to hit them as they swing. And you know, if an ultra user is content to swing into you repeatedly and just miss, then go for the soul arrows, chip them down, let them waste their estus. It's not worth your time. I'm looking up here to be mindful of the plunges. I always get plunged here. And this is usually the area where ganks go to die. Not because the invaders are particularly good here, but like, just the pressure of the heralds and the constant lightning. It makes... it makes for very easy pickings. And any invader worth their salt will be working towards this moment to really get that pick. <laughs> The benefit of these stairs is that they're mostly an open area, and firing up or down along them with sorceries is relatively simple. Good pressure, good damage... You could annoy the hell out of people this way. When I see that the host is alone here, I realize that I can start to experiment a little bit with my combo that I have, my pseudo combo, but the Herald comes along and ruins everything. Which really is a shame because I feel like I would have gotten that roll catch with the Crystal Soul Spear. So here me and this co-invader are. We've separated the host. We've really just done our job. The phantoms are off doing God knows what. And I'm like, okay, well, it's time to chase down. But it just takes an eternity because this guy can't roll catch and I can. So at some point I had to switch with him and then he gets in my way. So I had to back off and start shooting soul arrows again. And then eventually he gets a firebomb or something and we take it. But it was just the longest, most miserable experience. Bring a curved sword. Just, if I see you, bring a curved sword. If I have to come up there, if I, the sorcerer, have to come up behind you and do the roll catching, something is wrong. However, because you have the S stock, you can roll catch extremely well, and that's actually almost entirely the point of this setup, is that you can just roll catch and roll catch for days and days and days, and as long as you have stamina, you could put on the pressure. Now, good poise or perseverance use will get you out of this pressure, for sure, but for the most part, if you can beat people out to it, then you'll be golden. You can do what normal weapons already do in a normal R1, R1 combo in like six hits, but it looks awesome and it feels really good to do. I feel badly for this Black Knight Sword Invader who just ran into four people and then got absolutely demolished. Bring a crossbow too, you know, bring a curved sword and bring a crossbow just in case. Now this specific invasion is really nothing special, and it's really not even necessarily a great showcase of the candlestick alone. However, I had these phantoms convinced that I was the devil. I had these three people so focused on me that they had no idea what was going on with the host. And sometimes that is enough. Sometimes it is enough to just be incredibly annoying. And that is one of the virtues of the candlestick that I suppose I didn't have on my list, is that with how little damage you're doing, and how much pressure you can put on, you're just annoying. And this is a good thing. Because sometimes the annoying trickster wins. Now let's talk a little bit more about what the candlestick just does wonderfully. It's the best one-handed moveset in the game, we've already said this, it has one of the best one-handed R1 straight sword hitboxes in the game. It's the same as the long sword, and that's quite good. It's a straight sword. It hits in a horizontal arc, which lets you turn and burn multiple opponents quite easily, which is very good. And it lets you use something in your left hand. Now this could be any number of things. It could be a Saint Tree Bellvine to free up a, ling a ring slot. It could be the Scholar's Candlestick, so that you could double candlestick it up. 
With the Scholar's Candlestick, you'll get 0.5% more damage than if you used the Young Dragon Ring, so I think that's advisable if you're using both Sorcery Rings. I don't usually use both Sorcery Rings with the Candlestick, though, because Chloranthi is just so good, and you need Prisoner's Chain or Ring of Favor, so there's really just no room for it. With the Belvine, though, you could easily make it into a Light Roll build if you wanted to, and this is something that I did think about experimenting with and still kind of am. And you don't need to soft swap to a catalyst if you wanted to run a hybrid build like this. You could just have the candlestick out the entire time. This clip is in here to showcase how you do not kite opponents, and you need to really make sure you keep your distance before you start to blender people. Or vortex them, I should say. Now alternatively, you could have the candlestick in your left hand and use a heavier poise weapon in your right hand. Uh, suggestions I have seen are the Moonlight Greatsword, a Crystal Halberd of some kind. I'm sure you could even make like a Crystal Zweihander work or a Crystal Astora. And this is how I saw Derpy using it as an offhand, which I do believe is a very strong way to use the candlestick. However, I'm a whore for numbers and I just like having the fastest options available to me. And I just don't think that an offhand straight sword R R1, L2. L1 in this case. I don't think having the straight sword L1 in the offhand is really as good as an S dot. It comes out slower, it's a little harder to roll catch with, it doesn't reach quite as long. I would rather personally have the S dot. However, if you were to use it as a sidearm, you could quite easily mix up with poise in your right hand and do something very similar to like a curved greatsword hand axe setup. That would work very well. Another thing is that because you have to invest faith in this, it kind of puts you in a position to go to 13 faith and use a couple of the faith-based tools like Replenishment or Filianor's Chime, which is another thing that was noted by Derpy and I did consider when I was making this. I don't really ever use regen because I'm busy using the FP for my sorceries, uh, and I don't like doing a lot of setup. I'd, uh, if I have to put something on before I like go into an invasion, it's just too much. It's too much thinking for me. I want to. I just want to go in there and do do the thing. I have places to be. I have invasions to do. I've got people to kill. I don't have time to put on tears. I don't have time to do replenishment. I'm sure it's great. I'm sure it's fine. I just. I don't care. <laughs> Exceptions to this being like the Lothric War Banner buff or like Power Within, because that gives me more damage, and that means the invasion will be over faster. But if I die because my spacing is bad, then that's a different story. So ultimately, your game plan is to get roll catches with spells. And your entire melee kit is designed to force those rolls. Now when I say roll catch with spells, everyone thinks, oh, you know, Soul Greatsword. And yes, that is one of the ways you can do this. But I mean also, with just a basic Great Soul Arrow, you can get some roll catches. You could use Great Deep Soul as well and have pressure that is moving towards your opponent while you are actionable. You have what is functionally a wake-up option moving while you can continue trying to get S-Doc L2s. That's a very strong way to do it, and you'll see me do L2, R1, Great Deep Soul quite a bit, especially into the later clips. Another way to keep your pressure going without directly roll catching someone is to do L2, R1, Homing Soul Mass which will not trigger immediately because there's a bit of a delay between when you cast it and when it homes. So what you can do is you can end your roll catch chain early to have a pressure option as you continue to fight them. And the reason I think this is strong is because out of the R1 hit stun, someone is guaranteed to roll, which means they cannot hit you as you are doing the homing soul mass cast, which is already quite fast in and of itself. But also, it comes out faster from the R1 swing than it would be to just pull out a catalyst and cast it, or to even have a catalyst in your offhand and be casting it. The recurring theme here is that being able to cast out of a straight sword R1 swing is really good. Being able to cast out of any R1 swing, it's the reason why the Heisel pick is so good, even in the offhand, you can cast out of putting out a very good hitbox. Here I accidentally roll catch this fucking 
red because I can't lock on to the people right in front of me because it thinks that this red is really the threat to me. Now this crystal soul spear looks horrible, but I made a snap judgment that the red would not swing four times in the middle of three people. I thought that he would be smart enough to roll after maybe the third one, and I knew the crystal soul spear would not hit him if he did, but he didn't. So that's my fault, and I should not have expected that. However, L2R1 crystal soul spear is one potential roll catch you could try. And you can mix up your timing out of the R1 swing to try to catch different roll timings after the first roll. There's a lot of variance here, and it is not guaranteed at all to get damage, and you can have people that do just swing out of it, but it is very fun to go for. Lapista Nebularis has a very similar build with offhand Thrall Axe and main hand Golden Ritual Spear, and I love it. It's very similar to how I try to do this, where he uses the offhand Thrall Axe to pressure, and then he can use the Ritual Spear as like a very good R1 that can immediately transition into a sorcery. Sadly, the Golden Ritual Spear is a little bit more stat intensive in a lot of ways, um, and it has a scaling with Faith instead of Int, so you have to invest in both Int and in faith, and you don't really get anything out of the int investment. But offhand Thrall Axe and Golden Ritual Spear looks really cool when it's done well. Here's a little clip of a lovely invasion that I got with the Mused. And uh, yeah, I lost this one real hard. And I was just trying to pull them through the level to get something going, but honestly, it was a lot of work just to even kill the one blue that I did. And even then, I needed to bring the Lothric Knight into it to get anything done. Another thing to consider with this type of setup is that you're threatening at many ranges. You're threatening at any lock-on range because of your spells, but then you're also extremely threatening within your S-Dock range, which is quite long and quite fast. And because an S-Dock hit, not hitting an opponent in poise, like actually getting the hit stun of the S-Dock hit, guarantees your Vortex it becomes that much more threatening and frightening to play against. Now, obviously, I'm not very good at it. <laughs> I'm not very good at it, but the idea is that once you begin your pressure, that it doesn't stop until they are very low health, and then you get an Estus Punish. Things to consider in the future of working on this build or doing something similar is to invest way more into stamina, because that is where the money is here. You need stamina and you need damage because you are very low on both of those. Obviously you also need health to not die and you need attunement to cast the spells at all, but like you don't need that much attunement for the spells that I'm using. I think I need to never attune Crystal Soul Spear ever again because I always overuse it and I use it in the wrong places so much. It is a bad spell to use wrong because if you miss, you've just lost 43 FP. And that could have been how many soul arrows? That could have been how much homing soul mass? Well, it could have been two homing soul masses, but still, it's a big investment to miss with. You need a lot of trigger discipline to make Crystal Soul Spear work. And even then, you're just better off doing anything else. Put Great Fair and Dart on. Put uh, Snap Freeze on. Save yourself some, some agony. Unless you're trying to get that L2R1 Crystal Soul Spear roll catch, just put something else on. And here you can see me just blood tinge Evelyning this blue's health away. And he opts not to heal, I guess, before trying to get the win axes on me. I value him attempting to use the Hollow Slayer. I do not value the win axes. This is a wonderful little invasion against Fell. Felicificity, the dearest creator of Pick and Poker, who I also got the idea for the candlestick from in the first place. On one of my sorcerer videos, I don't know how long ago, he recommended the candlestick because it had a wonderful flow to it. And I did not get what he meant until I had used it myself. Dearest Felicificity did actually help quite a bit in making this all possible. 
and I'm happy he did because it is just one of my favorite builds that I've ever made. It's just so fun. It does everything right. You can be very mobile, you can have a lot of pressure at melee range, and you have sorceries. It's the closest to a, like a pyromancer that a sorcerer could possibly get in this game. This or Heisel pick, and even the Golden Ritual Spear, and the Immolation Tinder, which is nice as well. This is just kind of a nonsense gank with <laughs> Felicity and I off stalking each other while dashing throws miracles at us. Which brings me to another important point that because you are a sorcerer and you can kind of fend for yourself in your moveset, you play an excellent supporting role at just about any soul level. Because soul arrows are no joke. Soul arrows and great deep soul and even great heavy soul arrow, nothing to scoff at if you have another person on you trying to roll catch you. This is a little duel I had with Rat Snake. It, it didn't go so well for me, but it does kind of show off the ways that you can use the build in a 1v1 situation against an opponent that's relatively competent. <laughs> And Ratsnake is more than relatively competent. She is wonderful and amazing. Many of the people that I invade with or invade against are wonderful. A specific thanks to Rofo the Germ and the many others of his Discord. To Jello, No Name, Sare, Lapista, obviously, Fel, Aroth. Wonderful people that I spoke to as I was making this. This nonsense construction. Rat makes really excellent use of the poise, and I think I start to catch on to it, so she switches to the Goddard's Twin Swords, which, you know, outrange pretty much everything I do, but not my sorceries. And she's making these very difficult to hit circles around me, because all of my sorceries go in a straight line and will not hit that. Then I was thinking I could probably catch her with Soul Greatsword at some point, and I think I do end up doing that. But then ultimately, it is my reliance on swinging into poise that does get me killed here. It's another reason why I'm thinking about making this into a light roll setup, because you can... I'm pretty sure you can roll out of attacks faster on a light roll build than on a medium roll one. However, I don't believe I would use the S-Stock. I would probably be using mostly sorceries, because being at melee range as a light roll build is not very good unless you intend to roll every single attack. Which is why many light roll builds have things like whips and crossbows on hand, so that they do not have to be at close range if they don't want to. The Crown of Dusk is not necessary, but if you really want to feel how bad your damage is, wear literally any other headpiece and see. It's extremely difficult even with just the Crown of Dusk, and one Sorcery Ring to do any reasonable damage. If you had maybe both Sorcery Rings, you could get past it. But that means I can't wear Chloranthi, and I really just can't abide by that. That that will not do. Alternatively, you can have someone drop you a bunch of budding green blossoms, but we've already discussed how I don't want to have to put things on at the start of Invasion, so this is not happening. On screen we have a wonderful example of the ever-present threat of a great deep soul, which I have long lauded as one of the keystone sorceries to have at your disposal. The ability to have a constant stream of pressure going with a great deep soul is just unimaginably strong. It's so wonderful. It's like set play in a fighting game. It's, it's like being a zoner, but you know without being incredibly annoying. Any sufficiently skilled player of Dark Souls will have no difficulty dodging the Great Deep Soul. It's not a matter of hitting people with the Great Deep Soul. It's a matter of making them roll with the Great Deep Soul. And once you've made them roll, you have an offhand thrusting sword, which is very good at catching rolls. It comes out on the same frame as a two-handed curved greatsword, the fast version, and it is 
active for the same number of frames as well, which makes it very good for roll catching. Which is not something that I need to tell anyone, but like, it's good for a reason. <laughs> if people want to trade into pure magic damage with a sorcery, let them do it. Now in case you've hit the 30 minute mark and you're like, Prin, why don't you just use a longsword that's infused with a crystal gem and a catalyst? That has to be better, right? And I would say to you, yes, it probably is just better. It probably is just all around better at doing damage and applying pressure. But it feels very bad. It is not fun. First of all, I do not like playing neutral against any opponents with just a straight sword. It is an incredibly boring process that I would not wish upon my worst enemy. Second of all, I've already done that for like a year, two, three now. I'm ready to move on. Personally. And there are a number of very good reasons why no one would ever want to use the candlestick and why no one ever should. It's got the low damage output like we've already discussed, the low spell buff, it's stamina hungry, and you don't even have access to things like Steady Chant. You have a functionally useless, in PvP, weapon art that you will never use. You won't. It is stylish. It is a nice little thing to light your candle, but it is effectively useless. And lastly, this is not unique to the candlestick at all. It is not unique to any specific build, really, but if someone has an even slightly bad connection, you're going to have a really bad time landing those s dot pokes. Actually, the entire point of your build that, like, the startup of your attacks is fast basically gets thrown out the window with a bad connection because poise lag? Lag poise? Lag poise. Lag poise nullifies that entirely. You just don't have your one advantage anymore. And initiating that vortex is kind of your win condition. So when you can't do that, it sucks. On screen, you will see what is basically an example of an Aldrich gank, and that it is. I will often leave Aldrich Faithful on at 60 plus 6 to just try to get some invasions as I'm waiting to get an invasion in an actual location as a red. Which is really just to feed into my lack of patience. I don't really much care to be waiting around for an invasion for more than like 30 seconds, and if I do have to wait for 30 seconds, I'm not gonna bother. You would think that like with this horrible soul arrow spam play style that I have that I would be a little more patient when it comes to these things, but it's so up and down. <laughs> I suppose I should start wrapping this up now. In closing, I will say that if you like vortexes, using sorceries, having an off stock, generally irritating your opponent, then this build might be for you. If you like doing a lot of damage, beating poise, having poise yourself, then this might not be for you. Which is fine, because this is an incredibly niche, incredibly weird play style. I thank you all for coming here today, and for providing me the opportunity to share with you what I consider to be one of the more fun play styles in Dark Souls 3 at this time, however many years after it's been released. If you have an interest in making lore for a character like this, you could easily say they're a cleric that has turned away from their faith to the path of magic, and that would be just swell. But I think it's time we've moved on to do some other things, and based on what I've been saying throughout this video, you might have an inkling as to what it would be. A build that might be a little faster and a little more aggressive. A build inspired by one of my favorite games that is not a Souls title. The only real question is, can I make it a sorcerer? We will see. But for now, I bid you adieu, fellow wizards. Happy casting, and happy invading. <laughs>